Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. This time on the bench, we have this kind of funny Ford Mustang. I guess it's like a novelty watch of sorts. If you look at the design, the outside is like a steering wheel from a Mustang and then the inside has the, the logo for it. As you can see, it is running a little bit too. Um, I, I caught this, this thing caught my eye on eBay and I ended up picking it up because my dad was super into Ford Mustangs. He, in fact, had one that he fully restored. It was beautiful. Uh, and I thought it would be cool to take a shot at restoring a watch like this. Though, that being said, I'm not really sure what's inside. <laughs> Look at this. Uh, okay. So when I wind it up, it looks like the gear train is just flowing freely. There's nothing to hold it back whatsoever, which is kind of funny. I've never seen that happen before. Look at that. You can't even see the second hand. It's going around so fast. There it is now. So there's clearly something holding this thing back or maybe not holding this thing back. And we're going to find out today. Uh, if you've never watched one of my videos before, this is what I love to do. I love to take old broken watches and restore them. Sometimes they're for people that I don't know who have like maybe a family heirloom or something. And sometimes I find stuff locally or on eBay that uh, catches my eye. And I'm going to be doing that today. This is my uh, bolt action spring bar tool, by the way. I absolutely love this thing. It's one of my favorite tools, even though a spring bar tool is actually a fairly simple device. It shows that if you get a well-crafted, really well thought out tool, it can make even something simple a joy and a pleasure to use just like this one. And, uh, oh, that's interesting. So it looks like they bent the spring bars to fit that curved profile, or at least to fit the strap that was on it. I'll just hang on to those. That's a thing you can do. It doesn't break them to do that. And sometimes you need to do it. But yeah, we're going to take this whole thing. Yeah, see, look, it's a little steering wheel. <laughs> I, it kind of looks like the steering wheel that was in my dad's Mustang too. So I don't know. I, I kind of like it. And yeah, we've got a mystery on our hands here. First thing is we need to take this whole thing apart and figure out what the heck's going on, why these hands are just flying around like that, and then give it a service, get it running well again, and we'll clean up this watch and hopefully get it back so that it can be worn and enjoyed once again. That's what I love to do on this channel, and that's what we're going to do today. I'm really glad you're here with me. This thing's small, by the way. You know, the whole watch is about the size of a normal watch, but... The, uh, the movement and stuff only makes up that little inner diameter. So it's pretty small. I'm not really sure what kind of movement would be in something like this. It could be a, a movement for at the time, like a lady's watch, which would have been much, much smaller than the typical watch made for men. And uh, so that could be what's in there. That's kind of what I'm hoping because I've worked on those before. As you can see, I'm using a membrane box here. It's got a suspended piece of plastic in between so that you can put delicate items like hands and it will keep them. You see the, yeah. See how that's got its own little membrane. And then you just simply sandwich them together and it'll keep the hands uh, separated and they're not banging around or getting damaged or anything. Let's take a look at the movement. Ooh. Okay, I think I know what this is. Does this balance wheel want to spin? Oh yeah, actually it does look okay. This looks to me like a very inexpensive pin pallet movement. <laughs> In fact, look at that. One joule. This, this is a one joule movement. You know, the average that we work on for these on these watches on the channel are about 17 is the average. Some of them have 21 or even 25, but this one has one, which I guess does tell you the uh, the price point here. And, you know, that does actually make sense because, you know, let's be realistic here. The company that decided to make this Ford Mustang themed watch that looks like a steering wheel on your wrist probably wasn't going for super high end clientele, right? This is made for, you know, everyday people to wear and have, and it's kind of a fun little watch. And probably wasn't really meant to still be around at this point. So the big question is, is this serviceable? Can I actually service this movement? Because there are some that were made back in the day that are these, they're called pin pallet movements. And uh, I'll show you why when we get to that part, but they're cheap. Uh, and even 
in some cases meant to be either swapped out or thrown away. In other words, they're not serviceable. But in my experience, even the ones that people say aren't serviceable, serviceable actually are. And uh, from what I can tell on this one, it does look like it, it, it has, it can be taken apart and put back together. And that's really all I need. So I'd like to take off the balance, but it looks like the upper plate here is covering it and it's huge. The upper plate actually looks like it covers up about three quarters of the entire movement and all of the pivots, one, two, three, four, five of them. This is gonna be a pain to get back together. Okay, I do have room though to take out the balance and let's see how it looks. Yeah, that looks about right. And this does look like a pin pallet movement. Normally the movements that I work on on the channel are what use what's called a Swiss lever escapement. That's the default now. Almost all watches use that type of uh, balance. And this one doesn't. Okay, off comes the upper bridge and it leaves a pile of wheels here. Yeah. Okay, you know, this does have a similar setup to what you'd expect from a, from a movement that we work on on the channel normally. But I'm already starting to get nervous because these are so hard to work on. They're actually much, much more difficult than a normal Swiss lever, you know, a higher, a more expensive one. Not, I'm not talking about super nice, I just mean like the normal ones that we work on on the channel but it does look like I can take off the setting lever screw, which kind of has a weird shape. It's probably you, uh, dual purpose. Most of the parts in watches like this are made for maximum efficiency in manufacturing, which means that they're not set up for maximum, manufac uh, <laughs> maximum efficiency when it comes to servicing or even owning a watch like this, but they're made with as few parts as possible to make them as cheap as possible. And one interesting byproduct of that is that we're done taking this apart. <laughs> this is a, about the most simple movement you could get. And uh, yeah, we're done. Like that, that was the disassembly process because there are so few parts. This is a no frills movement, but also, as I mentioned, it's made to be very, very cheap. So I'm just going to put everything in the tray here. I'm only going to use up a little part of it. And as you can see, we're all done with the disassembly. Now, We've got some other things to look at here. Uh, I did want to take a look at the case as well as the crystal, as the crystal looks pretty banged up, but as usual, oh, interesting, it says Old England on it as well. That must be the company that it that made it. Well, that could be interesting because I did want to restore that crystal. We'll have to revisit that. All told though, this uh, case thing looks totally fine. Let's inspect some of the parts on the microscope and we can see a little bit of rust on the corners there. This is the pallet fork and this is the the pin pallet part right here. And you can see that part is what engages. Ah, there's the jewel. <laughs> oh, there's also some fiber here. That's really gonna bug me. So we'll take that away. Take it a look, there it is, the one jewel. It's the impulse jewel on the balance. I was wondering where they put the one jewel. You know, if you've only got one, where do you use it up? And it turns out it's on the balance. Now you can see where the pallet fork actually engages here with, with that jewel. So that's probably why they chose that. Okay, well, just like every other watch we do, I'm gonna put this thing into the watch cleaning machine and we're gonna send it through the three cycles plus the drying cycle to get it perfectly clean, hopefully. And then we can uh, go about putting the thing back together and see how that goes. Um, while the parts are being cleaned up, I did want to mention I've got a Patreon for this channel. It's patreon.com slash wristwatch revival. And if you sign up, you get a thank you card and a sticker in the mail, no matter what level you're at. And you can get access to like the videos a little bit early, um, commercial free versions of them, uh, stuff like that. Uh, if you want to sign up. So thank you to everybody who supports me on Patreon. For creators like me, it really does uh, mean the world. It means we get to keep doing the thing that we do. And if that's something that you like, well, Patreon's a great way to support your favorite creator directly. And that includes me. Thank you so much for everybody who supports me over there.
Now, as I said, I'm going to run this thing through all the cycles on the watch cleaning machine because I'm treating it just like I would treat any other movement. I'm just because it happens to be a cheap one. It doesn't mean I'm going to treat it that way and take a look at what it looks like out of the watch cleaning machine. As you can see, it's small. I mean, there's not that many parts and it doesn't take up too much space, but uh, you know, we have to have the same treatment that we would of this of anything else. Now, this is a, a tool that I can use to check wheels because check it out what I found. One of these looks bent to me and sure enough, it's quite bent. And unfortunately, you know, that means that it either needs to be replaced or we're gonna need to uh, fix it. So I figured I'll take a shot at fixing it. I mean, now this is just a watch I picked up myself. This isn't some, you know, super special thing. So let's see if we can't delicately uh, try to uh, make this wheel spin true again. Um, to do this, it's a little bit weird because it's tempting to get in there and just start, you know, but you really don't want to do that. These are very, very small parts. And as I mentioned, given the fact that these were manufactured to be inexpensive, they are using inexpensive materials often. And so you really do have to be careful. So I'm using a staking block here to try to give me a little bit of leverage. And I'm using just two pairs of tweezers to just gently kind of tweak where I can see if there's a bend or where it looks like it's not uh, spinning correctly. And this is just a slow process of, you know, little tiny bits at a time. You just really have to take your time with stuff like this because the moment that you overdo it is the moment that the part breaks. And yes, I am speaking from experience. I've tried similar things back in the day and I realized very quickly that it's less is more in a scenario like this. So here, once again, I can get a little bit more leverage on it by holding it against the edge and just gently tweaking the wheel so that I can try to get it again so that it uh, spins true. So I'm gonna put it back on the terrain calipers here and that'll again, allow me to spin it and see if we've made any improvement. Visually, it looks much better, but we won't really know until this thing spins. Oh, hey, that's way, wow. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, that's actually way better. And I honestly didn't think that I would be able to get it that good. So I think we can actually reuse this part and I don't have to go hunting for a donor movement. Let's find out if it spins correctly just in situ. So just as it, where it's going to be, but by itself. And this is another way that you can test to make sure that the thing that you're trying to fix actually works in the context of where it's going to be. The, one of the reasons to do this as well is because, let's see, yeah, that looks pretty good, is because something caused that bending, right? So it could be that something around it also got bent when that happened, and you'd want to know about that as well. But it looks like it spins freely, and I think we can call that a fixed wheel. Honestly, much to my surprise, and, and we'll continue with the reassembly of this watch. Um, this is the part that's scary. So there's a few things that are going on here. The two main ones are that this is a non-jeweled movement and the jewels on a regular watch serve multiple purposes. Actually, I shouldn't say that, it has one jewel, but the, the plates aren't jeweled where these wheels go. And the jewels ser serve multiple purposes in a watch. The main one is that they're a bearing. So there's a steel pivot, it's like an axle on one of these wheels and it is what interacts with that bearing. A little bit of oil, and uh, you have a much harder bearing than the steel, and that's a great recipe for long-term uh, light wear and good performance. But another thing that it does is this part, is that the jewels are actually shaped to sort of uh, let the uh, pivot, the axle again, fall into place a little bit easier. They have curves on the bottom sometimes that will help them kind of find that. They're also, since it's a jewel, you can see through it so you can like try to look on the microscope to see if the pivot's getting close. And with this, as you can see, it's just drilled holes in the top and bottom of these plates. They're just metal. On top of it, so so that's the jeweling part that's that's already tough. But another thing on this, the, the other thing on this, I should say, is that as you can see, there's the, the uh, barrel, and then there's one, two, three, four other and there's actually even another, which is this one, which is the pallet fork, they all have to be lined up the same. Wait a minute, what's going on with this pallet fork actually? 
Oh, we have found the issue. Do you see that post right there that's not there? You can see that crystalline structure under, underneath. That is almost always a sign of it having been broken. And it looks like the other one is too. This makes perfect sense for what we saw. And by the way, here's the movement. It's an EB8461. That'll help me search up the parts that I need. That's why the everything was just spinning freely. The pallet fork itself was not able to stop all of the wheels from just spinning out. So it makes good sense. So check it out. I actually found a real part for this thing. Like manufacturer part for this on eBay. And let's see if it's exactly the same one. It should be. It says it's the same. 8461 and everything. But this one should have two posts where those other ones had broken off. Uh, yeah, it does. I can show you, in fact, a little closer on the microscope. So do you see the two posts there? Those stick up and they interact with the escape wheel, which is what the pallet fork normally interacts with as well on a Swiss lever escapement. But this time they stick up and then the wheel hits them back and forth. And that's why this watch was doing that. So we did actually solve the mystery, which is pretty cool, but we still have to put this dang thing back together. And as I was saying, normally on a, on a well-designed movement, let's say, there will be like two separate upper bridges, right? One of them that will cover usually the barrel, the mainspring barrel there, and then like maybe one of the pivots. And then the other one will be what we would call the train wheel bridge. And that will cover like three or in some cases, four of the other pivots. And then there's a separate bridge for the balance. In this one, it's everything except for the balance. And that's a lot. It is many, many pivots that all have to be lined up perfectly before you can do this. And then there's even another trick with these, which is that since these are kind of cheap uh, parts, they're very lightweight. They, they're not solid. They don't sit still. They want to kind of fall over because they, if you breathe on them wrong, they go jumping out of, out of the pivot hole. So there's definitely something to getting these set up as well as you can beforehand to try your best to line up all these pivots. But it's one, two, three, four, five, six different pivots that all have to be lined up, including this pallet fork at the end too, that has its own pivot and it's floppy. And if, if it touches the other wheel, it'll fall down and all this other stuff. And by the way, before I can even put on the other part, I still also have to put on the keyless works. Interestingly, the keyless works on this watch is very similar to the real deal. So this is one that they either decided this was still the best and most efficient way to do it, or they just said, we don't have a better way. I'm not sure which one it is here, but like I said, it is basically the same system. It uses a sliding clutch and a clutch wheel, but I have to put these in now because since there's just one major bridge that goes over the top of everything, everything underneath it has to be in place before I screw it down and boy, I really don't want to forget something here because I'm really nervous about getting these wheels lined up. I've worked on another pin pallet on the channel here. I did a Mickey mouse watch kind of when I first started doing this stuff. And I think it was probably like a good hour and a half just to get that upper bridge on. It was really hard. Like it, they, these, it really tests your patience and they fall apart. They fall off quite easily. So we can take our first attempt here at this upper bridge. And like I said, we're looking at six different pivots that all have to be in. Now, one of them's easy. The barrel bridge is that big one. So that one's actually not too bad, but the other five are legit. I mean, they are tiny. It's those little holes on the top that you see there and they each need to have the pivot lined up to make it work. Okay, here's, a, here's an attempt. A little bit of pressure from my pointer stick here just to see if they'll fall into place. I did really try to get them lined up ahead of time. And just gentle movement to see if I can get, I don't know if I can get any of them, honestly. Definitely not yet. Let's take a look on the microscope and see what we can see. So there, we have one. <laughs> we have one pivot hole lined up properly. 
And of course, the problem is that if the bottom part of the pivot comes out, I can't see that from here and I have to just start over. And that can be a reason why they won't line up. Okay, we've got two. This is number three, but it doesn't seem to want to go in. You can see it down there, though. Maybe I can try to get this one next to it and then the other one will fall into place. That is kind of how it goes sometimes. This is actually the one that I repaired. Oh, so close. You can see them there, but it won't snap down into place. Now take a look at this. So this is where the pallet fork comes up, but also I'm noticing a design element here. It looks like that uh, pivot hole is actually removable. There's a screw on top of that. And if that's the case, I could take that off and instead of having to do all of them, I would get one fewer and that really matters. I mean, <laughs> trust me at this point, I'm like, yes, please take, you know, make this even slightly easier and I'll be happy because I am trying to get these things lined up and it is really, really difficult. Okay, so with that part off, will, it, will they go into place now? <laughs> Yes, it looks like they're getting closer. We see at least some movement under there. That, by the way, yeah, so this is where I can put back on the pallet fork pivot hole, and I can just screw that back into place. But see, this is much easier to get this part lined up on its own. And then I think the rest looks like it wants to be good to go. <laughs> I certainly want it to be. So this is where I can screw this part on, but take a look, it does look like the pivots are at least mostly in the pivot holes. Now I can replace that part and let's give it a wind and see if we got it. If the pallet fork jumps back and forth, oh, it does. Oh, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, so it really does come down to taking off that pivot. That, that is what it's about. That one extra pivot does make your life a lot easier. And now we can see if this thing's gonna run. It wanted to before, but it couldn't because the pivot, uh, the pallet fork couldn't interact with the escape wheel or the, in this case, with the uh, balance wheel here. Now we get to find out. Huh? No? It looks like it wants to, but it's kind of stuck maybe. Can you use some air to maybe free it up? No, not quite. Of course, we have to remember we haven't put any lubrication on this yet. I, I have no idea what the spec sheet is supposed to say on something like this. So let's just try the lubrication and maybe that'll loosen it up a little bit. I mean, this watch is pretty old, I think. I think it's from the 70s. And it probably has never been serviced. I mean, who services these things? Except for you and me. <laughs> We're the only ones crazy enough to service these. Okay. And we can address the cap jewel here. It does have a shock protection system. So that's pretty cool. I'm really curious to see what this upper cap jewel is though, because normally that would be made of a of a jewel, a ruby. For watches, they're synthetic, but they're identical to the real deal. Is it just metal? Yeah, I think actually it is. Yeah, it's just a metal cap, it looks like. A shiny, like a polished steel cap, maybe. So I can clean that off. I mean, that will serve a very similar purpose to what a jewel would. It's, it's meant to be hard, and flat, you know, so that it can take a drop of oil and sort of suspend it. And actually, this one looks pretty shiny, a little little baby mirror here. I really want this watch to run, though, because my troubleshooting skills on a on a Swiss lever escapement are getting pretty decent. Like, I, I usually at least have an idea of where to look. And this is similar enough that it probably translates over, but maybe not. I mean, I really don't know much about these pin pal. They're Okay, so nobody really works on them. Okay, I can replace this cap jewel now and uh, put the shock spring back into place as well. And we'll see if we've got a running watch. 
Oh, it did pick up and start running. Awesome. <laughs> Uh, that's great. It is, it is running. It doesn't look like it's running great, but it is running. Yep. It's all wound up as well. Okay. It looks like we've got a running watch. Let's see how it does on the time grapher. Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, the amplitude's good. The rate is absolutely all over the place, but I have no idea how to even address that. The truth is for, for a watch like this, like a novelty watch, if it runs a couple of minutes fast a day, it is what it is. If this is your primary timekeeping device, you are in big trouble. This is meant to be fun and run enough so that you can, you know, get through a day with it. But, uh, we're going to have to just be happy with that, that the thing is running again and keeping something of approximating time. <laughs> Cause this is not the kind of watch that you can go try to get it dialed in. Perfect. I don't think, or at least if you can, I don't know how. Okay. So now we're getting pretty good here. Take a look at this dial and we can get that put back on. I really like the dial on this. I, I have to say that, well, you know, the movement is an inexpensive one. They did a good job with the novelty aspects of this. That that looks like the real, I mean, it is the Ford Mustang logo, but it looks cool. Like it looks painted. It's not, you know, cheap. It has a little bit of luster to it. They kind of have the, it, it looks a little bit maybe like a gauge, something like maybe a, you know, checkered flag around the outside or something like that, which I just think is a nice touch. The hands, they're nothing fancy, but they are, they have luminous material. We call it loom on them. So they theoretically would glow in the dark, though these ones are uh, probably past their prime as far as that goes. And I can even just give them just a quick cleanup. But yeah, this watch is actually kind of cool. It makes me smile too, which I really like. Just got to put on the second hand now. Also, I did want to mention, you know, I've been trying to get people to get into this hobby. I know it's an intimidating one, but I really think that more people could do it than they realize that they could. Um, so I started a website with my friend Alex. It's called SutcliffeHanson.com, and you can get toolkits that I curated, like put together, made them, me and Alex do it all. And, uh, and you know, there's very entry-level ones all the way up to more advanced ones. For people that want to try this out, if you want to try it out as a hobby, you can get one of the entry if you're ready to dive in. There's some of the, the higher end kits that we have. And I, I did, I really did go through and pick every single thing on there. So I'd love to you check it out again at cyclifhanson.com. It's down below and, uh, you should try this hobby. It's really, really cool to be able to restore a little piece of history. Now, part of our journey with this watch is this crystal and it has the original crystal. It says old England on it. And I wanted to keep it. The good news is, is that old England is actually printed on the inside of the crystal so that it doesn't just get scratched off within 10 minutes of wearing the watch. And that means I can restore this crystal because I don't know that I'm going to find one exactly this size. Now this is after the first stage of it. And you're probably thinking, Oh no, <laughs> it doesn't look good at all. But as with many types of restoration, you know, the way to do it is to progress your way up from coarser sanding in this case, or, you know, any number of different methods that you can use to restore plastics or crisp or uh, metals or anything wood. And then you work your way up to the finer and then you finish with the finest to get a really nice finish. So after one sanding stick, okay, it doesn't look very good. I'll give you that. And now a little better, right? That's a little better, but you can still see all the little micro scratches on it and it's foggy. It's not clear, but as you can see, it slowly gets better and better. And now we can do our finishing touch, which is poly watch, which is a, a product that's made to polish, uh, Chris, uh, uh, acrylic crystals for watches. Um, and this will take out all those little micro scratches and leave us hopefully with a perfectly clear and almost brand new looking crystal. Let's see what we can do. It, it didn't have any major gashes in it or anything, which are, those are the only things that can be difficult to get out and take a look at that. Good as new, right? Didn't even need to get a new one. And we get to keep that logo that came with it on the bottom. Now, taking a look at the steering wheel, no complaints. I, this thing actually, it's kind of heavy, like it feels cool. And there's certainly nothing worth 
you know, restoring here. It doesn't need it. So yeah, pretty cool. Looks like the crystal does actually need to be pressed in. It won't quite seat itself normally. So it is like any other crystal that I put on a watch. I just need to use some of the smaller attachments that I have for my crystal press. This is the type that I prefer to use. It uses a wheel on the top. There's other ones that have a lever on the top that you just push down with your, your strength. But I like this wheel one because it actually allows you to be a little bit more precise. Just you can make very small adjustments rather than just having to kind of shove down and, and pray. So now I can put the crystal back into place, not quite down far enough. And this is the point where you do a little bit of trial and error. And once you can seat the crystal like that, then you undo the wheel and the crystal will just expand into the slot that was made for it. And of course we know this crystal is going to fit perfectly because it was the one that came on the watch. Oh no, <laughs> put the crystal on crooked. <laughs> That's really funny. N normally it doesn't matter which way you put it on, but I'd like to have that old England thing pointed towards the bottom of that steering wheel slash case. So I'm just going to take it off really quick and do it again. It just would have bugged me. It's not such a huge deal and you can't really see it that much when you're wearing it, but I'm just telling you that would have just bugged me. So it's worth it to take a few minutes to get this right. Even though this is like kind of a novelty watch, we still got to do it right. <laughs> and there's the old England there at the bottom now. So now we've got that done. Crystal looks good. The watch is at least technically running. And now we can recase it. It goes in a little bit weird here because of the steering wheel design. They put the crown down at the, what, four o'clock position, maybe 4.30 position instead of the normal three. Yeah, it's at four o'clock. But I kind of like that look too. And this should just snap in. Yeah. Nice, this thing is sweet. Uh, it's, it, it's so cool that it's just a little baby steering wheel. Now this is the strap that came with it. This is called a tropical strap. These are normally used on dive watches, but I got myself a racing strap here. This is actually a custom made one I've, I've had for years. I've worn it on a few different watches, but I figured it would be cool to bust it out for this watch because it's going on a Mustang, right? And these are these racing straps are you know modeled after ones that were used like on Hoyer watches back in the day, which were the really popular one for race car drivers. And you know they have those holes in them, I guess just because you're gonna be in like a hot race car and you wanna get a little more breathability but it also just looks cool and it looks way better than the one that came with it. Take a look at our Ford Mustang watch from some time. <laughs> I don't even know. This thing's cool. My dad would have thought this thing was cool. He would have laughed when he saw it. I definitely would have just given it to him and, uh, and he would have thought it was neat. And I do too. And I hope you do as well. That's our restoration of something a little different on the channel. Uh, this time around. I really want to say thank you, though, for joining me for this. This was a fun one. And I'm kind of, it's kind of a bit of a miracle that it's actually running. Uh, it turned out better than I thought it would, even though it's not really keeping great time. It is <laughs> trucking along and it looks cool. And uh, can't really ask for much more than that from a watch like this. So if you want to find me on Instagram, I am wristwatch underscore revival. And I just wanted to say thank you once again for joining me for this one. We'll see you next time.